Good morning to you. We're glad you're here. Good to be together on the Lord's Day. We have several that have been away on vacations back with us, and we're glad to have you. It's a pleasure to worship together on this beautiful morning. We're going to look today at the idea of God's people, but God's people not right now, but the very next generation. The next generation is coming, and it's coming fast, but then again, it always is. The simple fact is that a certainty upon this earth, as long as there is an earth, as long as time remains, we will have new generations of people. They'll come and they'll live out their earthly lives and then they will move on and another generation will follow them. Now, that is kind of in contrast to God. Now, it says a generation comes and a generation goes. The earth, as long as it remains, remains. In other words, and it will outlive many, many, many generations as it, had already, as it has already done. But the things of God, now that's a little different from the generations because unlike the things of life, the things of God have to do with every single generation that comes along. All generations fall into the realm of the things. We, what we see is generations pass, but what God offers stays the same. We're told this, that for instance, God is on the throne. Every generation that comes along, they may choose to serve God or not serve God. They may love God or reject God, but the bottom line is God will still be ruling, God will still be their God, and they will still have to be accountable to Him. Every generation that will be true, and every generation... God will be willing to show that He is a merciful God. And what man must do is be responsive to God with faithfulness on their part. You see this scripture in Luke 1 verse 5. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. Every generation who fears the Lord, everybody in those generations, will get the mercy of God. They will be the recipients of God's great mercy. Mercy, all generations, listen to this now, every generation, of course we're really talking about the people in that generation, <clears throat> if they are in Christ and in the church, it will bring glory to God because Paul writing back in the first century in the book of Ephesians says in chapter 321, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever. Every generation to the end of time will be the glorification of God because people are in Christ and in His church. This is so very important to realize it's why you need to be in Christ. It's not why you need to be a member of the church. I remind you when you're baptized, you're placed into both. You enter Christ and God adds you to the church. In every generation, that's going to be important. And... The plans of God, these will not change throughout the generations. God's plans will not alter. We may think that God will give up. <clears throat> you know, I have plans, and my plans over the years change, and, and I've had to alter them and uh, tinker with them and abandon them at times and add new plans sometimes. But the plans of God, they're always going to be the same. Psalm 33 verse 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of His heart from generation to generation. That's good news for you and me <clears throat> because it means that in generations to come, our generation being many years since the generations where He made some of these promises, that the promises are still good. God's promise of eternal life. Maybe many, many generations gone by now, but that plan is still in effect and it won't change. <clears throat> it's still for our generation and it will continue to be so. <clears throat> God offers His love, His faithfulness, His goodness to all who are faithful to Him in all generations. His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is going to be a good Lord. He will be a faithful Lord. He will be a loving Lord. He will be always loving us in every generation, and we can count on that. That's going to be true until the end of time. So, I want to state this morning, unequivocally, that it is our most solemn of duties 
to make certain that we have trained the next generation of God's people to be convinced that He is the living God, to give them a knowledge of God, and to help them understand that the Lord's people have responsibilities. So that as we grow old, we may one day rest our heads and we will know in sleep, in the sleep of death, that we have done what we could for the next generation. This is our, this is not a suggestion, this is a duty. This is our responsibility. Psalm 145, among many passages, says, One generation shall commend your works to another. Our generation will owe it to the next generation to tell about what God has done, His works, what He has accomplished. It is our job to declare it. <clears throat> it is not the job of the world. They won't bother with it. It is our job as God's people to tell it to the next generation all the mighty acts of God. That's why we go through the Bible. That's why we study. That's why we don't spend a lot of time, matter of fact, zero time, telling about home ec, that you would have called it in old days. We don't spend a lot of time teaching karate or financial courses. We don't spend time in this church educating people on all type of secular things. We are trying to pass on to the next generation with your help, as a matter of fact, we're trying to be the help to you, trying to pass on a knowledge of God, trying to help the generation to come to understand Almighty God. Please read with me, either out of your own Bible or from the screen, Psalm 78. We'll start at verse 1, where he says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. So I believe God would be talking to his people Give ear, O my people, to my law, and incline your hearts to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. I, I really don't know either why he calls it a parable or dark sayings. I'm really not sure about that. It's a mystery to me. But what he is discussing is what we have heard and known, what our fathers told us about the wisdom of God's Word. We will not, now listen to me, think about your duty as a Christian, think about your responsibilities. We will not hide them from our children. We will not keep the laws of God concealed. We will not fail to tell them to our children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. Far be it from you and me, my brothers and sisters this morning, to hide what God has done from our children and our grandchildren, and if the Lord bless us, our great-grandchildren. The wonderful works that He has done. Imagine hiding that. Imagine not telling them the things that they need to know. It goes on and it says, For he has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded to our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Okay, think about that for a moment. He's saying, you know, we have a law in our, in our kingdom, in our among our people. We have a law that God established. He established a law in Israel where he commanded our fathers to make the things of God known to the children. Now I think he's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9 where God said, Only take care, keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen unless they depart from your heart all of the days of your life. And then he says, make them known to your children and to your children's children. We have a law, Moses says. The psalmist says, we have a law in Israel. That law says you make it known to your children and to your children's children so that this will be passed on to the next generation. I've been doing some thinking. and You know, that's always dangerous for me. 
<clears throat> I have wondered why we didn't pass it on as well as we should have. And you know what? I've sort of blamed people, and I've, I've just thought of something the other day. In the 1950s, massive amounts of people were converted. It was unreal. You, you just can't imagine. Congregations of God's people, hundreds of people filling buildings to the point to where they had to build different buildings or branch off so that they'd, you know, just didn't have enough room for everybody on Sunday morning. That's how Union Road started. We just didn't have enough room. Those were those days. All of those people got converted. But I'm not sure all of them realized they had a job to do for their children. I mean, some of these people were probably converted midlife. Some of them were men coming back from the war. Some of them were, you know, in those situations. And did they really realize that they will need really firmly, solemnly to teach the next generation? I mean, they were all new at it themselves. Maybe they didn't fully realize how important this was. I don't know if that's a fair assessment or not. I'm just wondering if maybe I've said too often, well, they didn't do a very good job. Well, maybe they didn't know to do that. But I'm going to tell you something today. You and I know. So we're not going to do this one more generation. Whether there's any fault to be made or it just was cultural, whatever, it will be what it is. I can't change what the past has been, but we know. We know we have a duty. We know there's a job to be done for the next generation. Some of us have children that have not stayed with the faith. And I believe that we have a duty. You may disagree with me and you do what you want to do about it. But I believe we have a duty. And I believe our duty is to sit them down and remind them again how important all this was. And why their souls matter. And why this is significant to us. And what this has meant to us. You know, here's something missing from what I'm reading about some of these things. And what's missing is they were involved in telling the mighty works of God and reminding how great God is and how they needed to maintain faithfulness to God. And <clears throat> that's, that's an upbeat, that's a positive message about God. And <clears throat> sometimes I'm afraid what our message maybe has been is, well, you need to be up there at the church building, you need to take the Lord's Supper. And all of that's true. But you know, going to a building is not the same thing as impressing our young people with the mighty works of God. We've got to get in their hearts how wonderful our God is, how awesome a God He is, a mighty God. And if, folks, if we haven't been living that way, it's time to change, isn't it? It's time for you and me to do a better job at that and convince our families that our God is an awesome God. And He is a wonderful God. And He is a good God. And that we have perhaps failed, but if we've failed, let's start over. Let's start anew as best we can. They need to make this known to their children. Now listen to why. That the generation to come might know them. Know what? Know the testimony of God, the laws of God that they might know, the children that would be born, that are going to be born someday, <clears throat> that, that they will write and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. That's what we want. We may want a lot of things for our generation, our next generation. We may want them to be educated. We want, may want them to have good jobs. We may want them to go to college. We may want them to you know, be decent citizens, and I think that's all wonderful, but want what he says right here, that they may set their hope of God on God and not forget his works, then they will keep his commandments. And you know, maybe we just need to take all of our children by the hands and look them in the eyes and say, well, you promise me that you'll keep the commands of God. I hadn't done enough of it. Will you promise me that you will keep the commands of God? throughout the rest of your life. 
so that this may be perpetuated. And you know, I start going through the scripture. Moses, he comes along, and he, as his life draws to a close, he passes the torch, he, he gets Joshua ready. You know, what is physical child, but he's, he's getting the next generation ready. And so he tells him, we have to be strong, Joshua. We have to be strong. Moses called Joshua, says to him, in the sight of all Israel, be strong, be of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. You must cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Nor will the, uh, nor, so do not be fearful or dismayed. Why can't we look into our children's faces and say just that? Don't be afraid. Live the life that God expects of you. The Lord will be with you. The Lord will help you. He will go before you. He will help you in your life. But you go and do what He is asking us to do. Then Joshua got old, and Joshua got ready to leave this earth, and Joshua started preparing the children of Israel who are now a whole new generation come along, and he reminded them of how God had helped them. All of this I'm going to read for the next few slides comes from Joshua 23. Joshua calls all Israel together, all their their, uh, elders, their judges, their officers, and he says to them, I'm old, I'm advanced in age, but you've seen what the Lord your God has done to these nations because of you, for the the Lord your God is He who has fought for you. Joshua reminds them, You need to keep these laws of God. He's been your God. He's helped you. Be very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it from the right hand to the left, lest you go in among these nations. You're going to go out there and you're going to be in the world and you're going to be surrounded by some worldly people. But you don't turn left or right. You stay with God who remains among you. You stay and do what's right. I say to our young people, the new generation, not just teenagers, just the younger crowd, you understand you'll be here when we're gone. If the Lord hasn't come back, you will be here when we're gone. Do not turn to the left or right. Stay with the principles of truth as laid down in the Word of God. Joshua gathers Israel together and he said, you're going to have to hold fast unto the Lord. You shall not make mention even of a false god. You will never swear by them. You don't ever serve them. You don't ever bow down to them. You hold closely to the Lord your God. You hold fast to Him. Don't let this world system corrupt you or deceive you. You'll be surrounded by it. Don't give in to it. Be strong. Hold fast to the Lord. David came in his generation. Youthful David that slew giants got old. He barely could get up out of the bed. But he called Solomon and he asked Solomon to live a certain way. My son, may the Lord be with you and may he prosper and build the house of the Lord your God as he has said to you. Only may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding and a charge concerning Israel that you may keep the law of your God. Then you will prosper if you take care to fulfill the statutes and judgments with the Lord's charge Moses concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage and don't fear or be dismayed. Are we hearing some similar themes as we go through? He's saying, let's keep the laws of God. You stand steadfast by this, Solomon. You you stand, you've got responsibilities. You're over a house. He's over the house of God. We're over our own houses. You be strong. God told him over and over again, be strong and be courageous because it's going to take this to be the people of God in the next generation. You know, the prophet Joel, he talked about We all need to understand year after year, day after day, the generations need to know about the day of the Lord. I like this. I just threw it in here. Colossians, I mean, sorry, Joel 1. He says, tell it to your children. Let your children tell it to their children and their children tell it to that next generation 
And you drop on down, well, what are we supposed to tell? That the day of the Lord is near. The time is coming. We are accountable before the Lord. Now, I think his day of the Lord was a day of reckoning for Israel. But there's a bigger issue than this, and that's the ultimate day of the Lord. And it is coming, and we need to be ready for it. He said, you need to be telling your family the day of the Lord is coming. Sit them down and talk to them. Not about all the things at school. Yeah, other times, other places, fine. Not about all the activities of life. Tell them the day of the Lord is coming. Tell our children about the judgment day. I'll never forget one time a lady came out of class and was kind of mama against mama, and one mama was upset. So that Bible class teacher scared my little girl telling about that there's going to be a judgment day and there's going to be hell fire. If that's the first time the little girl heard it, that parent was failing. It's time to talk about it. It's time to warn our children. There is a judgment day when they grow to an age of accountability. They're going to have to answer to God for what they do. You go back and read them from the book of Ecclesiastes. Read them in chapters 11 and 12 where he talks to children, young people, and says that the Lord will call you into judgment for all the things that you do. Youth don't get a pass. Very young children are safe because they're unknowledgeable. But a child reaches an age where they will answer to God. Are you talking to your child about those kind of things? Paul reminded Timothy certain things. He said, we need to talk. Our talk has to be that you need to be reminded. Now keep in mind, that's not his natural child, even though he calls Timothy like a son to him. But he says, I remind you, you're going to have to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. What is he saying? He said, being a Christian is nothing to be ashamed of. Let's have that talk with our young people. Being a Christian, drop the spirit of timidity. You're not called to be timid. You're called to be faithful to Almighty God. The next generation needs to know. Timothy needed to know. One of these days, you'll be in charge of passing the truth on down the line. See, what we're saying today, you and I need to do for our generation, what we need to do now for the next generation, but that generation, our kids they're going to be older one day and they'll be passing the message on themselves. And Paul told Timothy, my son, you be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. The things which you've heard from me among many witnesses, you commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's not just say pass it to our children, pass it to this next generation of young people. Right here in this congregation, it doesn't have to be your kids, it's these kids, all of our kids in a way. They deserve to know. The next generation needs to know and be taught. And, and so who are we saying has this duty? Uh, Psalm 71 verse 18 says, Even to an old age and gray hairs, what he's talking about there, but anyway, he says, Oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all who come. Now he says, I'm getting old. Now the gray hairs are popping out, but don't let me die until I've told the next generation what they need to know about you. Don't let me go. So who needs to do this? You parents especially have a responsibility. You grandparents. A lot of this is said, your children's children. Not just your children. Keep it going generationally. The elders of the church the preacher of this congregation and any preacher in any congregation, the Bible class teachers. Sometimes older members think, well, our, our job is through. We have nothing else to do. What, what job do we have to do? Oh, we've got plenty to do. Tell the next generation. That passage we read up there, if you got gray hair or if somehow or another you escaped it because you have good genes <laughs> or if you have no hair, Tell it to the next generation. He says, before I die, let me tell it. 
You tell the story. You impart it. You get it across how important this is. All of us as Christians need to accept this responsibility. What happens if we don't? What's going to happen if we don't pass this on? Well, we have that demonstrated in the Bible. In the book of Judges, it said they didn't. And all that generation who were gathered to their fathers, there arose another generation that didn't know the Lord. Are there any about the work that he had done for Israel? Well, then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Do you want that to happen to your great-grandchildren? Do you want one day your lineage to bear children that don't have any idea what the Lord and the Bible and the church is all about? Do you want that for your family? Do you want a time to come when because they don't know anything about the morality of the Bible, they start to do evil? In verse 14, by the way, after these verses says that the Lord had to take, had to afflict them because of all of this. The Lord, the Lord's anger got kindled. Do you want the anger of the Lord kindled against your future generations? You say, well, I won't be here to see all that. Do you want that though? That's your lineage. That's your future. That's your contribution to this life and to the Lord's work. Don't, don't let that happen. Let's do our best not to let it happen. Another thing that the text of uh, Judges, which just heard the case with them, he said there wasn't any king, there wasn't anybody telling them what was right and wrong. Every man just did what they thought was right. Well, that's chaos. It's moral confusion. It's not a good standard, it's a terrible standard. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it says, when God's people don't know anymore, they get destroyed. The word destroyed there can mean a number of things. It can convey the idea that they just perish. They're brought to silence or they're undone or cut down. They're just ruined, in other words. When we don't have the knowledge of God, it will ultimately be a ruination to us all. And you know what's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen is what's said in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. We will grow dimmer, our light will grow dimmer, our influence will grow dimmer, our people won't know, and finally many of those will go away and they won't replace the ones that are here. And the Lord says, you know what? When you get like that and when your influence wanes, He said, I will have to come and remove my lampstand from its place. In every church in that Book of Revelation 2 and 3, chapters 2 and 3. Each church had a lampstand. It wasn't a physical one. It represented the presence of the Lord in their midst. And he says, you may have church of Christ on the outside on the sign, but on the inside, the Christ will be gone. And I will have taken my place out from your church. That's a scary thought. And it's exactly what the Lord said he would do. Okay, we'll close on this scripture. Psalm 102, verse 18. <clears throat> this is kind of my closing remark, okay? Let this be recorded. Okay, maybe it needs to be written down in our Bibles. On the side margin, in the back, in a blank spot. Let this be recorded for a generation to come. So that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. Boy, I think about that. Those kids and some of those kids back there that are mine. Let's shove it 40, 50 years down the road. And there will ch be children unless they're blessed with an extremely long-lived grandpa. There will be children yet to come. I won't see their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I won't see them. But that's who we're talking about. You know, let me tell you today, those children hadn't been born yet. If the earth continues, the Lord hadn't come back, there will be children born. And they hadn't been born yet. You know what? Those kids don't have a voice right now. And today, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they don't have a voice. Nobody's speaking for them right now. So you know what? Pat Jones is speaking for him. And Pat Jones is speaking up for those children and saying that if you love 
those children, you tell them about the Lord. You talk to them about these wonderful things that we've got to be a part of. You don't let them abandon it lightly. You instruct them in such a way that they will be convinced that this is important. And if they have strayed, you sit down with them and tell them again how important it is and why they need to come back to it. Believe me, I've seen young people that bucked the Lord for a while, but they came back later when they realized how important it was to their lives. Maybe you need to sit down and think a little bit about your own history. Not everybody's in the same boat, but I have parents and grandparents and perhaps great-grandparents that I didn't even know, some of them, but had a connection with the Lord. And here I am today as a part of that lineage and a part of that. And for whatever failures any of them had, they passed along enough to get it down to Pat. And some of you had the same thing. And you might not be here today if they hadn't. Been. So why don't you think about what your children, grandchildren, great-children, great-grandchildren, the people that have yet to be created, and what they will need, and why you need to be for them and here for them now. Thank you for listening to me this morning. I feel very passionate about this. And I feel we need to do as good a job as we possibly can do. And I believe we know what we need to do. Do a good job. Pass it on. There is a generation. If the Lord doesn't come back, there is a generation to come. If you need to obey the gospel today or be restored to the Lord, the invitation of yours, come and be baptized into Christ or ask for the prayers of the church. We will pray with you. While we stand and sing, we would invite you to come.